Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to the Talking Dean podcast. I'm your host Majid and today I have with me Rash and brother Imi. How are you doing my brothers? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, doing pretty good. Another <laughs> another podcast in lockdown. What can I say? Yeah, wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. This is my first one and I'm uh, glad I'm uh, on the show for the first my first podcast. Alhamdulillah, yeah, we're, we're honoured to, to, to have you on and uh, I think maybe Rush, I think this is the new normal, you know, like work now, because uh, I'm looking for work at the moment, so a lot of places, uh, they've actually closed their offices and stuff, mm-hmm. because, you know, especially those places where the where their lease was up, you know, um, and, and they haven't renewed because they're able to, you know, get people to work from home mm-hmm. and still achieve, you know, all their targets, so um, you never know this type of podcast might be the way forward yeah it, it serves a, it serves a good objective still we can still do them but i think i'm just probably missing the, the physical human contact side of things more than anything else i'm sure for the listener it's not too different because especially if you're listening audio only then you know it probably doesn't matter too much the fact that we're all separate but certainly for a bit of chemistry of being together with brothers chatting about dean remember we called it talking dean for, for that reason, that few brothers getting together. Um, so I'm missing that bit, I've got to admit. But other than that, I appreciate, yeah, you're right. It probably is more likely that we'll continue to do them this way for a while still. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we haven't uh, lost the social element to uh, to proceedings in the, uh, in the podcast in the lockdown. No, I don't know. I think everybody's craving human contact again. So I suspect it won't be like that. But I, at, at the same time, I don't know. Do you think there are some people who will prefer to live like this going forward? It depends how social you are or not. I think those who are antisocial, they probably love this kind of uh, setup. Yeah, well, is, yeah. You know, the society the society is already going down a route where people, they don't really want to interact unless they have to. I mean, even just say like uh, 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 supermarkets and stuff, you know, the, the people would rather just go through the self checkout because normally you go to, uh, you know, uh, the counter and, you know, how are you doing? And people don't want that interaction. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing I notice is, uh, you know, the point that Rush makes about human contact. And I, uh, in January, I came down with uh, COVID and it wasn't, it wasn't really bad as I've heard other people having it. But, you know, those 10 days, it was just when I was in self-isolation, it was weird where, you know, uh, after being a release, shall I say, you know, after, you know, mingling with the rest of the family, it felt strange. And, you know, just just the element of touching someone or or being, speaking to someone in person and looking at someone in the eye and talking, that was something which in 10 days, you know, it, you know, it, I was like craving it. Mm. So, and that's why if you think about one of the worst punishments that we see in prisons are, are things like uh, the solitary confinement mm. because people know it's a punishment that take people away from people it's actually a punishment and and I do fear that it, uh, there will come a time where people won't really want to interact and, and they'll lose social skills and, and all sorts mm. you know what I mean so so hopefully it, it changes quick yeah it's a, I think it's a challenge for the uh, dower as well isn't it and the dower crazy because they have to uh also be more innovative in order to contact people as well yeah with exactly. the social media and other uh, tools and devices yeah, yeah, for, yeah. For, normally you'll be going out to places and meeting people talking to them but obviously now this is all changed and uh it's a, it's a so yeah so you have to devise new innovative ways to uh, get the message out isn't it and actually you know that point you made there is is, is important and actually leads into the sort of topic we want to speak today me that right now you know, there's huge challenges that Muslims face around the world, okay? But let's just say in the West where we are. But around the world, there's, there's challenges and, and they vary. And now that, you know, uh, maybe you're not able to just go and meet people and speak to them, the issue is is that the problems that people are facing haven't gone away just because COVID came. So what we want to speak about today was it just... It just seems that you're uh, not just at the moment. It's been going on for ages, but just say now, it just seems like um, there's so much propaganda against Islam in the sense where it just seems that Islam is in, is in the dock. Islam is is guilty until proven innocent, and and it just so so happens that as Muslims, we are 
uh, in a place where anyone can ask us any question about our our deen or anything like that, right? And we feel like we're obliged to somehow explain uh, to people, and and some uh, most of the time in a very defeatist way, you know, uh, where we're trying to explain things, and uh, it just seems like there's this huge propaganda and, and this attack against Islam. Now, linking it to your point, what you said is that now imagine this is still continuing and before you'd speak to Muslims about these issues, but now you're not and, and Muslims are a bit more isolated, but they still got these problems, right? But what I want to just maybe go to the first question and ask you guys, and we can probably discuss this is, what we are seeing is, I mean, the attack, on, but the attack uh, against Islam is nothing new. And also the questioning of why is this and why is that? This is nothing new, right? But what we're seeing um, a lot recently is it seems like Muslims, um, they're not able to deal with these these arguments or these questions. Uh, they either shy away uh, or sometimes, you know, they might even make something up just to appease the, the person who's asking the question. Why do you guys think we we are facing this kind of problem with with a lot of Muslims today. Uh, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that it's as if Islam is in the dock. So when when you when you think of someone being in the dock, it's like some putting someone on trial, yeah, being quizzed and being interrogated or whatever. I think you're you're, you're right using that term um, because I think as Muslims we've allowed that reality or scenario to exist where we have to justify Islam yeah but we know that Islam is free from any accusation or or charges but the problem lies within ourselves as Muslims I think that we've lost the confidence or the correct method of thinking how to uh, give the correct arguments how to rationalize on certain uh, realities how to give the correct uh, answer and the Muslims in the past they were the spearheads of uh, Islam, they were the ones who were spreading the deen and they had the correct understanding of the Aqidah and the Sharia rules and how to propagate them. But since the decline has set in, the Muslims have just lost that way of uh, thinking mm. and how to come across uh, intellectually because Muslims are very emotional at times. And they do it out of sincerity, but sometimes that reaction and emotion spills over into portraying the Muslims as being irrational, so to yeah, speak. Yeah. So, so, so they can't really portray the ideas in the correct uh, manner. And and this has a uh, this has a, a massive psychological effect, isn't it, Rash? What do you think? No, definitely, because like you say, then people start stop um, start losing confidence, don't they? And if you lose confidence in something, then your natural trait is to go, let's not speak about it. Yeah, because you speak about things that you're confident about at the end of the day. So if you lose confidence, you're like, okay, this is part of me. Is you know, you're Muslim at the end of the day. But if you're not confident about it, then what you do is it's dead easy to get into a conversation with someone and and leave it about football or about a movie or about other things that are not Islam because you're not confident speaking about it, especially when you're talking to non-Muslims. It's so bad that if for some people, even when you're talking to Muslims, we focus more on you know, these entertainment things. And why is that? It's because we're not overly confident. Having said that, you know, then when sometimes you get into those discussions about deen, about Islam, and, and I'm talking Muslim or non-Muslim here, then when someone listens to a person who's confident, you notice that they engage in that discussion because I'm sure you guys have come across it. When you talk to, especially non-Muslims in this example, is what they have questions they will say, oh, yeah, so why do you believe in Islam? Why oh, why is it that you give up so many of your so-called freedoms for this um, religion of yours? They want to know the answers, yeah? But often it's us that don't steer the discussion mm. in that direction. And I think that comes from a lack of confidence and similar to what Imran's saying. Um, yeah, I think if the, obviously the onslaught is uh, against Islam and the, and the, and the Muslims, but it's, this has been carrying on, it's been going on for centuries now, mm. yeah? So the Muslims were at the pinnacle of their revival or, you know, at, at the, uh, their, their understanding of the deen was crystal clear at one point. But all of a sudden, that started to decline. Mm. So what the uh, 
I think the, the onslaught, there was two aspects to it, the intellectual... Just, the just, want, to, just want to stop you there just for a, a second. You, you, you said that at the, uh, the pinnacle, the, the ummah, the, the, uh, when they were revived, their understanding was, you know, at the, at the, at the highest level, right? So, uh, so are you saying that, uh, you know, when, when, you, when we're talking about confidence, that Muslims don't have confidence... Is because they don't have that clarity, they, ha- they don't have that understanding, and so on. Which you're saying that in the past the Muslims did have. Is that what, is what we're saying? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because uh, the Muslims in the past, they they always base their thinking on the on the Islamic Akida. Yeah, so they would come across a new reality, they study and research that reality, and then gauge that against Islam. What does Islam say? Is, is it compatible or not? Then they'll give their own verdict or opinion on the matter. They reject it, yeah, if it's not compatible with the Islam, and they won't, they wouldn't, they would never justify it either by twisting the text, for example, just to fit mm-hmm. it in with the uh, Islam. So the Muslims, they, the non-Muslims, they attacked the uh, the political side of Islam first, yeah, not the spiritual side, because even the non-Muslims, they'll fast with you, they'll probably pray with you so they haven't got issue with that it's just the political aspect of it and then also the attack or the questioning on the actual iman or the akida itself so for example you got the um, things like the penal code cutting the hand of the thief stoning the adulterer yeah the way we slaughter the animal yeah these things that they if a muslim can't really answer these questions how to you know uh, rebuttal their arguments then the Muslims will find it difficult to portray or propagate their deen in the correct manner. Mm-hmm. And I think so, so this is how they lost uh, confidence in the systems of uh, Islam as well, for example, the penal code, the social system, and you know, why do women dress in a certain way? Look at you, you, you know, we, we free mix every time, you, but you're, you're segregated, a woman can't travel without uh, non mahram And even the issue of economic, uh, in the economic system, that Islam is not fair, the woman gets less inheritance than the mandos yeah. so you know so these kind of things that uh, make a muslim they want to defend it but they don't know how to yeah. and then when they can't that's when they lose confidence in uh, yeah. in islam no uh, those are all very yeah i think those are things that you you probably need to break in into all of those areas you could probably have a full podcast on any one of those areas because like you say i think when you say revival i think the word i liked that you used is the the crystal clear you know, if it's something's crystal clear, back to my original point about confidence, if it's clear in your mind, it's so much easier to speak about. If it's not so clear in your mind, you steer away from it. Um, and I was thinking about this question, Majin. I was thinking you can probably, we, we blame Muslims, but actually there's lots of factors here. It's not just an internal issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just, just to add, we're not, uh, it, it's not a blame game. Mm-hmm. We're just talking about what, what we're just diagnosing a problem. Yeah. So we're, we're not any better. We're not saying we're better than people out there. We're not blaming anyone yet. <laughs> no doubt. No. So that's why I was thinking. I, I generally, I'm sure it can be broken into other categories, but a few areas that I thought of was firstly that nowadays, you know, what they try to do is by presenting Islam as something evil and showing like th- this is the source of many problems on this earth. So regularly they talk about terrorism and they say, look at where these wars are happening. It's always Muslim lands where wars are happening. Look at, you know, when we did that podcast on separatism and stuff like that, look at these Muslims in the areas where they do come and live in our countries. They want to live on their own, then separate themselves. You know, they're the problem. So I think one aspect of this confidence comes from, you know, them presenting in the media and in the wider scale that Islam is the problem to many of the world's problems. That's yeah, one yeah. thing, yeah? And then at the same time, it's very clever. You know, if you, like, you know, the concept of like a bogeyman, you know, if you have a bogeyman, if you have certain issues yourself, but you point out, let's say there's two of us and there's certain issues I've got, but I constantly point out your faults to everybody, people focus on you. Mm. Yeah? They don't focus on me. So for them, it's very easy. If they don't focus on the issues that capitalism, you know, their way of life, the issues that that is bringing and point to Islam constantly, then the masses naturally go, well, yeah, it must be Islam. That's the problem. They don't have that opportunity to point to their own systems that are are decaying and causing such 
difficulty. Yeah? yeah. And then and yeah. then finally, just that third part of it, I thought, is that then as Muslims, what we've done is we've started to prioritize fitting in rather oh, than thinking, oh, oh, actually, wait there a minute. You know, we should prioritize being on the front foot presenting Islam. If we're trying to fit in, do you know what we do? We change our criteria. So our criteria moves away from being Islam and becomes, you know, fitting in, freedoms. And I will tell you something, I'll tell you later into the podcast. I heard something in the, in the news this morning that I think fits quite well, but I'll, I'll save that for, for a bit further on in the discussion. I just wanted to just, just mention, I mean, just uh, in the last couple of days, uh, you probably know Pope Francis. Mm. He's, uh, you know, uh, on a historic visit to Iraq. And if you if you check on the internet, you know the sort of like headlines or you know Pope Francis denounces extremism on a historic historic visit to Iraq. Yeah. You know, and, and in the article it talks about the Yazidi women and how they. So, it's like you're saying is that's a really I've never really thought about it that way, bro. But you know, it's like a it's like this tsunami that the Muslims are facing, where already you're being shown as being uh, barbaric and evil, and and so that's like that's a starting point, right? You know, so so when people are speaking about it, and I mean, and the example I want to just just add to that third point that you made, which is fantastic about having to uh, appease because and using criteria. Because one thing I don't understand is there's a lot of Muslims who, for whatever reasons, whatever agenda, they go on to TV shows, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes they go on to TV shows where they even know that the presenters normally plays this like a hard man type of role and he's going to attack you and so on. So they already, they, they know this and then they go on and then as, as expected, I mean, just, just the example for that, the sister that went, uh, the new head of uh, MCB, Muslim Council of Britain. And when she was asked by the, by the presenter, you know, um, and but just before I mentioned what, before what she's asked, you know, if you think about it, th- she went on there trying to show that it's historic. It's a historic moment, right? It's a historic moment that I'm the first woman head of MCB. Now I'm not sure because we've only saw a small clip, so I'm not sure whether the presenter does bigger up before that. But it just so seems that rather than uh, them encouraging and saying, "Excellent, you're the first woman," it looks like you're, you're it's like Islam's going places and stuff like. That. Even though obviously we don't agree with that, right? But. Uh, she went straight into it, you know. Tell me, um, how many uh, women imams do you have, right? And she knew the answer to this. Now the issue here is that this the sister should have been confident enough to say, wh- explain what you mean. Do you, if you mean the imam in the sense like someone's leading a, a mixed congregation or with men in there, this is not allowed in Islam, so we don't have any. And the way the the presenter tried to trick this sister is to compare it and say well in in christianity you have uh women priests and in judaism you have women rabbis like putting the guilt trip on like surely you should have a a woman imam right but the sister she couldn't answer the question and and the reason why is a, a she a what i observed was she knew what the answer was she uh didn't answer it because she never had the confidence uh, I'm this. I'm not attacking. I'm just saying this from what I observed. But also, because had she answered it, she would have answered it on the criteria of Islam. But she's there to present Islam in a way where it agrees to their criteria. So there's no point even giving that answer because it's just going to get you in more trouble, mm-hmm. right? Because because a lot of people what they do and it's that point you made and it just made me think about this rush that. We're trying to sometimes when we do try to defend Islam, we try to defend it using their criteria, their basis, appeasing them. And in fact, that gets you in more trouble where the Muslims won't even be happy with you. And even the non-Muslims won't be happy with you because the Muslims will be saying, like, oh, why didn't you defend Islam? And the non-Muslims will be saying, oh, you couldn't even defend Islam. What kind of person are you? Yeah, I think she would have been better off just saying, come out with it, saying that look, female imams are not allowed from Islam. Yeah, but it's as if she has to kind of justify it based on their criteria. Mm. Yeah, so she has to like pr- prove, uh, present some kind of uh, some some kind of thinking in order for her to understand that 
there shouldn't be any imams, uh, female imams. Uh, no, but but think about me. The, the the criteria was set. Mm. Jews, Christians have women priests, and Jews have women. That's the criteria. I this is the criteria now. So so you should be <laughs> on this criteria. Mm. Had she said no, then Islam would not be. It would not be seen as acceptable according to that criteria. Well, that, that, that's the thing, isn't it? Because if you say no, because this is again, this is a Sharia rule, isn't it? It's from the Quran or something, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you can't prove the Sharia rule on its own. You have to go back to the source, isn't it? Which is the the, the text evidence. The yeah. Evidence here. Yeah? Mm. So because we could prove that the Quran is an unadulterated speech of Allah, and this is where this rule emanates from. Yeah. So this this is the correct manner of uh, proving that the, there are no female imams in uh, Islam. Going back to the source, which we can prove. So it's, it's, it's th- th- this is just one part of the problem because you got loads of 101 Sharia rules. Yeah, for example, I went to uh, I can remember a few years ago going to Nottingham uh, University, and in the Q and A, the speaker, Muslim speaker, he was justifying what polygamy, why man is allowed to marry more than uh, you know more than one wife, like four wives, mm. and in the and he said that uh, the man only could get married if the woman can't bear any children, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then non-Muslim in the in the crowd put a hand up saying, "What's the problem is with the man? Why can't the woman uh, get married?" One. So, this, so you got to be struck now. So you understand? So this that's the incorrect way of presenting Islam and, and the arguments for Islam, mm-hmm. because again, it's a rule which is from Allah. Only Allah knows the reason why this this rule is real. So as a human being, as Muslims, we can't be on the same level as Allah. In order, in, you know, in order to justify the reason why this rule was revealed, no, that's not the yeah. correct way. And the correct way is to go back to the source from where these rules come from, and and prove that it's the same way as in uh, you know, Muhammad Sallam went to on the night journey, Muslim. and mm. even Muslims today, you know, when the 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 Muslims, the, the non-Muslims, they mock the Muslims saying like you bl- you guys believe in flying unicorns, yeah. When Muhammad Sallam went to the on the night journey, he went on uh, Barak, isn't it? Yeah. And then, but then how, 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 how do you actually prove this? You know, flying unicorns, that's what children believe in. But it actually happened because the text says it happened because it emanates from the, from the Quran itself. And Abu Bakr's stance and the system, unfortunately, should have been on the same wavelength as, page on, as Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr was asked, Abu Bakr said, if Muhammad Sassam said it, then it's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's where he got his title of a Sadiq. A Sadiq, yeah. Yeah. But you know, the, a quick question. You you, you talked about the you talked about sources, right? Do you think the problem also um, about confidence, about being able to stand firm and 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 use your criteria? Um, and because the thing is, if you're gonna go back to the criteria, then what you're saying is, look, I don't want to speak to you about the rules. Let's speak about whose criteria is correct, right? But do you think there's even even a problem in the way we like uh, uh, certainly Muslims, the way we carry, the way we've come to the conclusion uh, of of whether uh, Islam is the truth, that the Quran is a speech, the direct speech of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the Sunnah. You know, do you do you think there's a problem? Uh, Rasha, I'll ask you the question. Do you think that there's a problem even the actual fundamentals? Obviously not in everyone, but I think when, especially when these type of examples that you use where someone's going into a public domain and at the end of the day, she should know as someone of, you know, in a position of responsibility, we know if Allah has already warned us that, you know, the kuffar, they are your, they are enemies to you. And when you're talking about the likes of the BBC and the the track record they have, and you're talking about this particular woman as well, and she has a bit of a track record as right, well. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so you, you should be prepared. You know, in any walk of life, if you oh, you mean the present? Sorry, you mean the presenter? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, okay. So yeah. So now I, th- I think the the sister's name Zahra, Zahra Muhammad. She should have known that. Look, at the end of the day, I'm going into the dragon's den, or I'm going into the a, a den where I'm I'm representing Islam. So I have to go in prepared. You know, if you're going into a battle, you need to know what your enemy's weapon is. If your enemy's got guns... Yeah, but bro, bro, this is the problem. I don't think she even felt like 
uh, she, she was going there and I thought she felt like she's going to go there and get appraised. Exactly. And this is what, this is my point, isn't it? She didn't go in prepared. She went in thinking, oh, these guys are going to be very positive towards me because at the end of the day, look, we have progressed from just all male leaders of these um, organizations to a, a, a woman leader. So she wasn't expecting it. And to give her, you know, the benefit of the doubt, mm. she probably went in and she probably even thought at the time, you know, if I answer this correctly, this is going to lead to other questions that are going to be difficult to answer, yeah. you know, which, which, so it's easy for us to say in hindsight, oh, you should have answered it this way, or you should have answered it that way. So when I proposed this question, I was, I delivered a khutbah on this topic. Yeah. And when I, and I spoke about this khutbah, I was saying that the, when we go into that environment, firstly, we need to be prepared for what your opponent is going to bring to the table. Yeah. And secondly, it's back to my original point about criteria. Um, I'll give you that example now because it fits a bit better with you, this part of the discussion. Um, so today in Switzerland, um, mm -hmm. did you hear that the, the niqab? Yeah, is, re referendum or something. Yeah. So the niqab is and the burqa is being banned there for use. But you know what was Again, I shouldn't say shocking because I'm not surprised this is the BBC. So what the BBC did is they brought two Muslims to discuss the topic. Okay, so the first Muslim was a sister and she openly says, I'm a liberal Muslim. Yeah, I'm a liberal Muslim and I believe in freedom for all. So I'm even though I don't wear the hijab, she, so she was a sister not wearing hijab. She goes, I believe in the right of all sisters being able to cover, even if it's the niqab, because it's their freedom. So you first have a sister here, a non-covering sister, using the criteria of the West and using the criteria of capitalism and secularism to say the criteria is freedom. Yeah. And if you think that's bad, the second example is worse. Okay. Because then an imam came on. Yeah. And the imam said there is no precedent for niqab and burqa in the, the the woman does not need to cover her face this is not this is not correct in islam so mm -hmm. i actually support the government's um strategy of banning the niqab so an imam was calling for the banning of the niqab yeah man. yeah and then when he was asked or well, then he was asked oh but what about do you think there's a, a bit of an islamophobic agenda behind this you know, this is a bit anti-Islam. He was like, I don't care if it's anti-Islam. Mm. So, so firstly, you're attacking tenants of Islam. Secondly, you're ignoring that these guys are openly anti-Islam mm. and you're supposed to be an imam. So here we're blaming a sister who, mm. I say blaming, it's not blaming, but here we're discussing how a sister approached it. But yeah. what can you say? If you're imams, people in positions where you expect better, are coming out with absolute trash like this, then, you know, clearly many people are not well prepared. It's not just the minority. Bro, what, what I would say to that is, it's no coincidence this particular guy was brought on that TV show. Mm. You know, um, and, and in all honesty, even though the, the, the sister, the first sister's argument was flawed because it was based on liberalism and all this sort of stuff, right? Um even from her point of view, she was she was literally more liberal <laughs> than, than, than this guy because I remember years ago. You I don't know uh, um, probably probably you guys remember there was a case where there was a, a young sister in a school in um, Bradford and she was wearing the khimar, mm. uh, sorry the khimar and the jilbab. And they kicked her out of school because they said it, it, it didn't. This is years ago now. It didn't because now, nowadays it's common, right? Um, but at that time it was sort of new. And so obviously the sister she went to court and stuff like this. And what happened is the the school then went to a local imam, and I think he was you know he was Pakistani, and I think he was more leaning towards like uh, Brailvi Islam. Bra is Brailvi not Brailvi Islam, but Brailvi, right? And he turned around and said, look. Shavar, shavar kameez is perfectly fine right so what happened was you know her case in a way sort of collapsed because you have a guy who's a guy who's an authority who rather than saying no she should be wearing this um is saying no shavar kameez is a complete fine uh, so he was more traditional more cultural 
but it didn't help. But you know, just I think is is important, uh, and I think Rashi made the point. It's not everyone, but I think certainly uh, one thing is is for sh- is is for sure that if you're confident about something like Rashi was saying, you are going to you are going to defend it. Uh, you're going to know you that, that because the confidence is built on knowledge. Yeah, the confidence you have in it is because you know it's right, right. And I think that's why one lesson I think that's really important that that we can take and 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 uh, and the people listening and and the wider Muslim communities can take is the fact that you know that that knowledge that we require in Islam that's going to give us this confidence in our deen. This is something which shouldn't be seen as second or third after money after wealth after you know this should be uh, a priority this should be a priority and then for the parents is a priority just for themselves but certainly more so is that you got children coming home who are also under this bombardment and when they ask the questions if their parents can't answer it a they think you can't really be confident about something you don't know and sometimes the parents might even give it like a, a wishy-washy jumbo uh, more cultural type of answer where it disagrees with reality even. It could, might be something completely bogus, right? And then what happens is this actually, you know, can start to uh, take people down the route where they start even questioning their, maybe their iman, the fundamentals, the, the foundation. So I think first and foremost, uh, an important message is that as Muslims, we need to get closer to the Quran. We need to get closer to the Sunnah. And, you know, we need to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? One question I want to quickly pose to Imi. Um, you mentioned earlier on how this wasn't a, a new attack on, on Islam. And also, we, we don't want to restrict this attack on Islam as being just something in the UK or in the US and so on, right? Uh, so do you want to elaborate a bit more on about where, where this set in? Because I think, I think, I think if we look at history, we're sure, surely we'll be able to see a stage where the Muslims were on the, on the rise. Um, intellectually, and then they started to go down downwards. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, this issue of uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, confidence. I mean, historically, in the time of Muhammad Sallam, Sallam, you had slaves who were standing up to world superpowers. Yeah, first they were subdued as uh, slaves. Yeah, and they didn't even have the the guts to speak uh, up against their own owners. But then next thing they're standing up to the Romans and the Persians, yeah? So when uh, Sumeya, when she was being uh, tortured, and Mubsa Salam said, have sabr, Jannah is yours, what did she say? She said, I can see it. Why? Because she had that confidence and that conviction in in uh, Islam. And this continued for for a while. But then the Muslims, the, um, the Muslims started losing confidence in Islam because the Muslims didn't really, up to about the 17th, 18th century, they didn't really have a rival on the world scene. The Uthmani Khalafa, for example, yeah? But, and then all of a sudden, the Europeans, they embraced a new ideology, a new idea, which was capitalism, and the creed was secularism. So, so just, they, just, just to, so, so a rival intellectually or as a military, uh, as, as military power, like rival in what, in what sense? In, intellectually, because they started, they, they started posing questions mm-hmm. uh, to the Muslims. But because Muslims didn't have a rival, they thought they were way ahead of the Europeans. But all of a sudden, the Europeans were coming out with new ideas and questions and inventions even. Yeah? But the Muslims, they realized how far behind they were lagging and they couldn't really appreciate or understand how to counter these uh, questions. Or in the, the, because of these questions, this, this attack was on purpose because they knew that the Muslims were the superpower at that time. Militar- militarily, they couldn't be defeated. Politically, they couldn't be defeated. The only thing that made them strong was their belief in Islam, the, the Islamic Akira. And even the Europeans, they understood that once the Muslims lose confidence in this, that's when we'll be able to defeat the Muslims as a superpower. So the examples that we gave, obviously these are recent examples, but in the past when they were attacking the Sharia rules and matters related to the penal code, economic system, and Akira related matters, the Muslims didn't know how to... Uh, uh, Go, go about uh, you know, countering these. But the Europeans, they set up uh, missionary uh, schools in the, in the disguise of uh, schools that will uh, educate the Muslims in sciences. But what they were yeah. doing, they were actually, on, on the, on, behind the scene, they were indoctrinating 
the Muslims, but the Muslims didn't know how to uh, how, how, how to be offensive in terms of intellectually uh, rebutting their ideas. They took these ideas on board and they just tried to justify and it further weakened the uh, the Muslims. So the Industrial Revolution helped the Europeans to come up come up with a new uh, uh, creed, which is secularism. And unfortunately, some of the Muslims they actually use secularism to justify certain concepts saying that law is compatible with Islam such as democracy, human rights, equal rights, feminism, etc. So, you know, the, the, these kind of things. So we have to use Islam as our basis in order to judge other ideas and see if they fit in with uh, Islam or not. Yeah. yeah, subhanAllah. So so in a way, um, uh, what we're seeing today is, is like you said, is, is a continuation. Um, but I think what, one thing, I don't know if you, uh, I'm sure you guys would agree, I'm sure you will, that yes, a decline set in the ummah, uh, and you know uh, we see that uh, a state authority, as in the uh, the Uthmani uh, Khilafah, was uh, occupied uh, after World War One, um, and in 1924, the actual position of a uh, Khalifa was abolished. So it sort of like totally ended any any conversation there, and we saw that the lands were uh, separated and uh, you know under national identities and so on. Um, but what we do see then, alhamdulillah, and this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fact that the truth is the truth. You know, like if no one was carrying the truth, it's still the truth, right? So inevitably we see that, you know, uh, a revival started to occur in the ummah and, um, and we are a situation where, you know, those Muslim, Muslims today, are, I would probably say, are, are as, a, as on a global ummah level, are, are far more aware of their deen than maybe those at the time towards the end of the Uthmani Khilafah, you know, because now we do see the fact that, you know, there are Muslims, and the fact that we're having this discussion today, that there are Muslims that are talking about um, having, uh, giving, having intellectual leadership to Islam, to the Aqidah, something that you need to be convinced about. Uh, but I think that's 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 an important point, uh, 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 and the reason why I asked that question was just for 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 our audience to really appreciate and comprehend that when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran that the the disbelievers they want to extinguish the light of of Allah, this is something which isn't restricted to a certain time. You know, it's gonna it's gonna continue till you know the the day of judgment, uh, and 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 what we see today isn't just limited to Muslims in the UK or limited to our times. In fact, these things have been happening for a very long time. And maybe, would you, would you say that maybe uh, it's, a bit more, it's a bit more aggressive today because they, they do realise that Muslims are getting closer to Islam? Yeah, no, definitely. It is more aggressive today. But you know what? You know, when you ask that question about, you know, is, this is a, you know, the good way of putting it is, is an existential you know, it's always, there's always going to be a battle between Haqq and Batil. We know that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that. This attack on Islam today, it might look new, but we know it was, it was there from day one, yeah? But I think it is important to differentiate it between the attack that happened previously and the attack that is happening now. Not because it's, it's a different attack, but you know, when you just think things are the same, you tend to use the same means to overcome them. Mm. Whereas if you appreciate that the, the degrading and the attacking of Islam today is done in a different way, then you will start to appreciate that you need to react in a different way. And if I give you some examples, yeah. So, for instance, we knew that we live in a very different world today than we lived in before. It's very connected. You know, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and afterwards, even the time of the, the early, the Khulafa Rashida and the idea that Islam spread, you knew that you could have spreading of an idea from one area to the other with battles, with people giving dawah and, and a particular idea spreading without it really affecting other places in the world. It could happen at like a, an, um, almost like a local level and a, a smaller a level whereas Regional nowadays, level. yeah exactly and whereas nowadays anything that occurs in the media in the news be it social media normal media instantly everybody knows about it what that means is those people who are fighting islam or attacking islam because of you know the point earlier about 
you know they want to show it as the problem yeah and they want to hide away their own problems now what they're able to do is at a very global level attack islam and what does that mean is that we're trying to defend islam as individuals they're attacking islam globally so it's natural for even someone who goes on one of these programs or these people who are brought onto the media to talk about Islam, it's, it's natural to feel, wait there a minute, the whole media apparatus is against me. Mm. Why did like brothers like Dili Hussain and stuff um, get so much credit when they went onto mainstream media and were willing to go into basically the dragon's den and stand up for Islam when you had like your Pierce Morgans and people like that on the other side. You're this one person against this whole media apparatus. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's very important to see that it is more aggressive, as you've just said. Um, it's a different approach. It's global. And this is why Muslims have to move away from this idea that, oh, OK, you know, it's just me as an individual. What can I do? And start to come together now and go, look, this is what's happening. Our deen is being attacked. Mm. What do we need to do? Look at the sister. Look at how she was spoken to. Are we preparing our children so that they respond better than that? Because if you think about it, how many of us, you know, we're not all natural debaters and natural speakers. No, not all, no. Exactly. So <coughs> how many of us, look, there's a big difference between having the knowledge and being able to present the knowledge. Yeah, you might know the, how to answer that question. You immediately just say, you know, there's none. Yeah, or this is the answer. But answering the question and then being able to explain it to someone and at the same time taking the fire from the opposition as well, it's not that easy. And I think we, if we collectively now prepare our youth to be able to answer these questions, and that is happening, by the way. It's not that it's not happening and organizations and institutions and Muslims and, and parents are doing this, maybe not at the scale that we need it yet, but it is happening. Then that's the only way we're going to be able to overcome some of these issues. Subhanallah. You know, the point you make there is, is, is I think sometimes without thinking, of, without actually uh, applying the perspective that you, you, you gave there, uh, Rush, uh, sometimes you can maybe... Uh, see, make it a bit simple as in this is how this person should have reacted but you know what we've got is we've got Muslims who are who don't have a, a, a state apparatus to, to protect us, don't have our own media apparatus that's on the same level and you've got individuals who uh, are actually being uh, targeted by uh, you know huge sectors whether it's the uh, media sector and you know and it's something which is going to be it's going to be difficult for Muslims to have that confidence because they're constantly being put down. Imagine, just take the example that you just gave yourself. Firstly, there's state apparatus attacking Islam. Then there is the media apparatus attacking Islam. Then there's the armies destroying our lands mm -hmm. and not allowing the Muslims to thrive and revive themselves. Then you have some of our own scholars that are apparently scholars who are being funded by our enemies to promote the incorrect ideas. Imagine incorrect ideas being filtered into your children, not just from the non-Muslims, but also from our scholars and our imams, some of them that are promoted to give out the wrong ideas. And then you have the whole ac academia, the whole academia that children are brought up in is secular. So it's like fighting, it feels like, it or can feel like fighting a losing battle. However, because of what you said earlier, that we have the truth, no matter how difficult that battle is, the truth will always, like you say, be the truth and it will always prevail. We just need to know that it's a big challenge. So who, who's, whose responsibility, moving on a, a little, uh, whose, whose responsibility is it to, you know, uh, try to reverse uh, the you know any decline that's setting people to try to give confidence to Muslims under this huge you know intense tsunami, whose responsibility is it uh, to be to be helping the Muslims through this? I was I was just gonna uh, mention to uh, add, add on to Rush's uh, point before you ask the question is that you ask the parents the parents say it's the mosque's fault. You ask the mosque they say. They're only with us for a couple of hours, one or two hours a day. So it's yeah. the parents' fault. Yeah. 
So no one's taking responsibility, but if we go back to Islam, Allah says, oh, you believe, save yourselves and your family from the hellfire whose fuel is men and stones. Who's, who's he talking about? He's talking about the parents, isn't he? Yeah. The book stops uh, with the parents. Yeah. And who's the first school for the child is a mother. Yeah. So it's a parent's responsibility that they are culturing and teaching their children uh, Islam. Yeah. So you can't blame in the mosque. They, they, I don't want to dig out the mosque, but yeah, but bro, who's who's gonna who's gonna culture the parents? That's that's a, that's another uh, good question. <laughs> Because that's one of the problems. That's yeah. one of the problems that the parents didn't get cultured, and that's why they can't culture their children. Yeah, well, by listening to this uh, podcast, hopefully they'll uh, <laughs> get some <laughs> get some culture. But it's, it's it's going to the like we the, the ideas and the principles and the concepts that we've mentioned. They should be learning about it because at the end of the day, what's 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 the basis for a Muslim? Basics. Mm. Basics is your belief, isn't it? Subhanallah. If, yeah, if, yeah. if your aqidah is solid, yeah, based on conviction and you confidence, have confidence in it then you're unshakable, yeah? So all these attacks that we're seeing, yeah, is, is because the Muslims, they, they, they're lagging behind or they're lacking that, that actual conviction in, uh, in Islam. You know, I just want to add to that point, Amy, that I was speaking to a young brother earlier this week and he's someone who studies fiqh and stuff and he was saying to me and we were just chatting um, about proof of creator and stuff like that and he said to me, what I don't understand is I'm doing fiqh, I'm studying fiqh but rather than what he goes, why I don't understand is how can we haven't started on the uh, the uh, the proving the creation and 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 uh, the aqidah? He goes, we've started on the do's and the don'ts. Mm. Yeah, and this I think this is part of the problem. It is part of the problem. And then also, you you look at uh, scholars and imams, you could find books on wudu or purification, yeah, volumes of it, yeah. Mm. Whereas the reality dictates that there are other priorities in place, yeah. Like we're saying that the onslaught on Islam and the Aqidah is intense that future generations, if we're not careful, who knows what state they'll be in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Islam, Islam is the one that dictates priorities and priorities at the moment is getting the Muslims at that level in order for them to defend Islam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then carry it correctly to, uh, to, to other people. So the book lies with the parents first, in my opinion. Yeah. And, because you know, it's, it's, it's a person is a product of this society, yeah. Until you don't change the society as a whole, yeah, the individual isn't isn't be the same, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum that we send our schools to is based upon secular principles anyway, yeah. And they they have uh, access to our children majority of the time, even than the parents do, yeah. Because you work in nine to five, they go to mosque for an hour or two, and then they're only with you for two three hours in the day, and then they go to sleep for school again. Yeah, and this is why it's very important for parents to actually talk to their children when they have the time. What do you learn in school today? You know, if they do basic things like history, sociology, psychology, or any subjects, just have a discussion with them. So at least you know what ideas they have been coming home with. Yeah, so you can actually give them the right understanding or culture and then actually, you know, say that, look, this is not from uh, Islam. So that as a start, that should be happening as, as, as families. You know, you sit down on the dining table or whatever, just for about half an hour, just speak to your children. So what, what, do, you, what do you learn in school today? And I'll tell you what the things that they tell you, you should be able to uh, refute that because you don't want them to hold certain ideas which are alien to uh, Islam. Yeah, but, but the thing is, what Majid's point earlier is very important because it, that's easy for us to say or easy for uh, someone to say who has learned a degree or gathered a degree of knowledge. And again, we're not saying that we have ability to answer these questions as well as anybody else, but at least we've tried to build up some of that thinking that we can pass it down to our children. There'll be a many parents, especially, remember, it's not even the parents' fault, is it? It's this society that has created this mindset that the parent is there purely to work and bring home mm. the bread. And then it's the school's responsibility to um, teach the children. So the parents, especially remember, some of our parents came here as first generation immigrants. They came here, not with the intention that they were gonna stay here for how long we're here now. So a lot of them was thinking, wait there a minute, let's just set myself up you know, maybe send back money. You know, if I have kids here at some point, we're probably going to go back. So that mindset was, was not there from the beginning. And sadly now, many, many years later, we're still here 
and people still have that mindset that they're just there to earn earn the money and someone else teaches their children maybe then we thought okay the mosques have a responsibility but this is the issue isn't it because we are now blaming there's a bit of a blame game there's the someone blaming the parents them blaming the mosques but this is where i think Maj's analogy that he uses quite a lot that i want to just remind everybody of is you know you talk about this analogy of a fish out of water mm. yeah this analogy of a fish out of water is we are all like fish out of water we're trying to solve this problem yeah whereas actually the problem of keeping people revived is solved by Allah's deen being implemented on this earth yeah. you know, when Allah's deen is implemented when the sharia rules are implemented when all of this corruption and fitna and stuff is not there in society when your academia is teaching the children in schools say you know in an islamic school a proper islamic school the children would be taught about how to prove a creator they wouldn't be taught about the fact that oh that's just a religious thing you know look science explains everything that's just something we'll tell you about so you know that there are muslims and christians and jews in the world whereas the the way things would be would be taught under a proper islamic system would prepare those children those children would grow up to be parents those parents would therefore have the right ideas if one child goes out of line and comes in touch with foreign and dodgy ideas you have the parent to put them right you have the media to put them right you have the school to put them right all of a sudden there's so many influences positive to keep them on track what are we we're that fish out of water there's no in positive in or very little positive influences to keep us on track however as time has progressed as you said after the collapse of the state like 97 years ago gradually after a period of time that revivals increased people started to go actually you know we do need to defend ourselves better we do need to understand our deen better but now at this point we're in that difficult situation where we haven't got all of those apparatus looking after us so what we do need to do now is say well let's collectively work towards you know improving our level of understanding of islam and that's where i do agree with imran at, in terms of now all we can do is work collectively be good parents make sure we prepare the next generation well so that that generation you know will be better prepared than us and then maybe the generation after that depending how long it takes will be better prepared than them it has to be a process also if i could add on to that is the parents are identifying where they send their children to get culture and uh, learn their islam from mm. and then obviously the parents themselves they have to have some sort of understanding in the first place of what is being taught is it right and wrong yeah and then maybe in future podcasts we could have a, a podcast on how to prove a creator the grand bean speech of uh, a lot etc you know just give, for that give some examples of yourself because we like i've got th- three children you've got i don't know how many children you've got in running <laughs> you've got a few i'm sure maj has got a few we've all got a few ki- we've got children so this isn't just hypothetical you know if i had a child how would i um, discuss with them so the way we go about it is like you've suggested is you sit down with them when these things happen in the media so my daughter a lot of these things which happen is totally different generation she'll find out about it from tiktok because the kids are on tiktok more than other stuff so she'll come and tell me something that's happened in the media and i'll like i'll be like oh how did you hear about that oh i saw it on tiktok oh but then okay how do you know to oppose that so she'll have someone who's opposed it correctly again on the social media platforms and then she might pick up those ideas but now and again she comes up and says so she might say something which is incorrect and then i'll say but she'll have got that from someone else trying to debunk it so maybe the hijab thing it will be like oh yeah that's our freedom we can wear it they can wear what they want why can't we what we wear what we want but if we don't then nip that in the bud and go wait there you're using their criteria to prove uh, an islamic rule that's not how it works then all of a sudden you let them go down this slippery slope without you know getting you know um advising them yourself first yeah i think what works well i've tried this with my own kids is that uh, you have to give them some sort of principles to understand and appreciate and so when they are coming across 
certain ideas or realities, they know how to apply those Islamic principles to the particular ideas or concepts. So for example, uh, just take the use of the mind to, to, to rationalize, yeah? You can only rationalize on something which you can sense, mm. yeah? A sense of reality, yeah? You can't pass a judgment on something that you can't sense, for example, yeah? So when we look at the creation, we can prove that there's a creator behind the creation. When we, we could sense that the Quran is a speech of Allah, we could prove the miracle of the Quran. But we can't sense things like uh, jinns, shaitan, yeah, and previous prophets, heaven and hell, life after death. We can't, we, we can't sense it. We, so we can't use our mind to come to the conclusion that they exist on their own. So we have to go back to the source from which it comes from, which is the Quran, to prove that. Uh, can yeah. I give a quick example of that? So recently, uh, my daughter was saying to me that how come it's easier to uh, memorize the Quran than other things? So she was going, mm. I've read books and it's, I would never be able to remember that. But how is it that because we're re memorizing surahs in the Quran, they seem so much easier to memorize? And again, that instigated the discussion of the mir miraculous nature of the Quran. Mm and how Allah has made it easier to remember and how this isn't the speech of man. This is the perfect speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we get these opportunities. I suppose the question is, is do we take the opportunity or do we even know sufficient ourselves to take that opportunity to then guide our children? If we don't, yeah. then mm -hmm. we are at fault, isn't it? You can't blame the children for that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the things that they, they learn at school, for example, evolution. Mm -hmm. Just say someone's child was to come home and say, I've learned about evolution, yeah, and it makes sense to me. Mm. So how? Uh, so he's, 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 the child is asking his, his parent, yeah, and if the parent doesn't know how to refute evolution, yeah, but he's he thinks that it makes sense and he says that we believe in Allah because we're born in a Muslim family, yeah, mm. that isn't going to be good enough for the child. He's going to go away with concepts like evolution or even Big Bang mm. theory, for example. I'm just giving an example, yeah. So, th so these are the kind of things that. The Muslims they should be aware of, and I was, I was listening to uh, a speaker from Birmingham recently, and he was called to a family uh, home because uh, one of their children uh, said that they're not convinced in uh, Islam, and he wants to leave Islam. And he's saying that, and it's a big problem in our society, apparently. That you know, because the children are the, the thing is, you can't play tricks with the mind. If you're going to be convinced with a certain thought, you're going to follow that thought yeah so you have to have another thought in order to counter counter uh, to counter that but, yeah? but is, there, is every sorry i'm taking your own much sorry the, if, is every parent gonna be ready to answer all of these questions you know it, you can learn some things but it's difficult to be able to be prepared for every eventuality that the school is going to throw at you like you say you know a parent may be really good at proving the you know proof of a creator but what if they are not so good at um, disproving evolution or something like that. But the thing is, you know, the Islamic Akida itself is not something which is really hard to grasp mm. if you've got the if you've got the correct understanding of it. Yeah. So you look at the companions; they weren't scientists, mm. yeah, but they were coming across certain ideas, but they knew how to apply the Islamic uh, Akida. So even things like evolution, yeah, then you go away and study evolution, not not adopt it. Obviously, you, you go and study it, and then you understand it and refute it based upon uh, Islam. So for example, evolution, for example, all right, the simple, the first question would be, all right, what's the origin of matter? Yeah, where did that, where did that matter come from? Yeah, it can't just appear from nowhere. Someone has to put it there, isn't it? And who's the one who put it there? It's, it's, it has to be the creator, isn't it? It's Allah. So yeah. you know, basic questions, things like that. Yeah. No, no, I think that's fine. I'm not trying to yeah. say that, you know, we can't refute something like that. But I suppose my the, what I was leading to is the parents, you're right, should be prepared to a certain extent. But this is where you need more than that as well. You know, so certain things, you know, like, for instance, if you've got a child learning um, A level physics or something, the kind of stuff they're going to come home and ask you. And I've had mm. this experience myself. So there was a, a, a young brother who came and we were speaking to him and he was throwing out all of these A-level physics terms and stuff like that as reasons why, you know, he was, he was basically about, he was, he was apostatizing. Yeah, he was leaving Islam because what his A-level physics teacher was teaching him. Okay, for, but for a parent, you know, especially when you're talking about A-level 
physics. You're not just talking about, you know, more simple what you'd be able to discuss with a, a younger child. It gets more difficult. It's not as easy to discuss with someone when they're talking about the technicalities, mm. of some of these scientific phenomena. So this is where I think it's, yes, you're right, the parent has to be a starting point, but there has to be other organizations and institutions and scholars and people that you can go to, people of knowledge, who will then say, look, this issue that I've got here, which I'm struggling to explain to my child or my son or my daughter, can you help explain it to them um, with that background knowledge of that particular subject matter? And I think that is there definitely is there but sometimes we don't take that approach we don't go wait there a minute rather than going oh I don't, you, it's easy to go oh i don't know you know why are you asking me i'm not a, a scientist you know it's, we should be very wary that that question may lead to someone leaving islam especially imagine if it's your own child so that's where you have to facilitate to make sure you go okay either i'll learn it and explain to them or put them in touch with someone who will be able to explain it to them yeah, subhanAllah, I think if we're going to continue with these examples, we'll, we'll be here all night because we've all accounted these sort of things. Uh, what I would say, um, just just conscious of time and stuff, is that uh, it, it, we're in a situation where Rash will give us advice, Imran will give us advice, someone else will give his own advice. The, the reality is, is yes, uh, the, experience, the, the problems we experience closer to home or with children and stuff, they are uh, they are the most important to us, but as Muslims, we have to really understand and appreciate that what we see is is symptoms of of, of a bigger problem, and you can't di- you can't disconnect it from that. And what I would say is that um, what we can do is you know the way we've sort of like presented this podcast is to say, look, basically you're up against superpowers, you're up against a tsunami, you know. And someone may take from that, Amaza, give up, there's no chance. But the reality is, is you have the haq, you have the truth. So I think what we uh, what we need to do is, if it comes to your children, what you need to do is you need to set some foundations, set some fundamentals so that when they do come across these ideas, that they can challenge, they can challenge them. But I think what the most important thing is that whether it's parents, whether it's students, whether it's young children, um, it's all about priorities. It's all about pro- what is more important to us, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran many times. He like he like he gives a formula, like if you obey me, if you worship me the way I'm telling you to, if you establish the salah, I will give you victory. I will give you. A peace and, 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 and removal of the fear and so it's like a formula and it works in both ways that if you stop doing this then the repercussions are going to be you're going to be dominated by your enemies you're going to be humiliated daily you will lose your children whether it's their iman or whether it's their lives so here Allah SWT is telling us that you need to get closer to Islam so whoever's listening to this and, and this advice first and foremost for us as well that Allah SWT in the Quran when he's addressing, he addresses believers, he addresses humans, right? And he addresses the jinn. He doesn't address scholars, right? We have to stop just putting the whole responsibility on scholars and, and not thinking we have to learn our deen ourselves. The reality is, is that every single one of us, as Allah Subhanahu says, and as it says on the canvas behind me, that I've created jinn and mankind only to worship me. This is our starting point. And everything else comes after this. And, and one quick thing I want to add and, and get your final thoughts is that it's true we need to teach our children do's and don'ts. But I think one thing that's really important, and maybe uh, Rash, we could probably do a podcast on this this because it's a, it's a big topic and I think it's important. We can tell our children what's haram and halal in a, very, in a way where LGBT is not, if they talk about it, don't take any notice or homosexuality or drinking or stealing and stuff like that. But one thing that's lacking in the ummah today um, is the appreciation of the mission of the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because either we're saying that we want we want our children or people that we know to be good Muslims, but then we're in a way still disconnecting that from what our goal should be is to be on the mission of our messenger. And the reality is that. 
we can all stop being good and, and practicing and praying and stuff like that. But as long as as an ummah collectively, we don't embark, we don't start and join this mission, then in 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years time, we're still going to be having the same conversations. And I think that's, this, is, this is something for another, another podcast. Uh, because I think, yes, if your children are, are, are bad, if they're praying and they're respectful, you've got some improvement. But we shouldn't settle for that because that's improved them. But what we're talking about is, is societal global problems. And these global problems are not going to be solved by just correcting our children in the way where just reject, reject these kafir, kafir ideas but don't instill in them any desire to work to change the situation. Just be happy with just doing their own worships. But then we're not working towards this change. But okay, guys, inshallah, what, what I want to do really is get your final thoughts on, on, on our discussion today about confidence and, and um, about, you know, uh, returning to understanding Islam and stuff like that. So Rash, I'll start with you. Um, any final thoughts on, on, the, on this podcast? Yeah, just a couple of short ones, really. Firstly, you know, right at the beginning, we talked about, you know, lack of confidence. Um, I think you already mentioned it earlier that we have to have the knowledge. So that goes without saying, you know, you build some knowledge and then you clarify it in your mind and you be ready. Yeah. Sure. What I would add to that, though, is that, you know, it's being prepared for a battle in terms of discussing these ideas with someone. You only get better when you practice. Yeah. So just going to your children that these are the correct ideas and then letting them loose in society, they will fall because what yeah. will happen is someone will come to them and they will say this is the right idea. The other person will go, oh, look, I've refuted you by saying that to this. And they won't have had that discussion, this Super clash of ideas that can only happen through practice. So a good way to practice is to your children, ask them questions and try to get them, make them slip up. And then go, oh, look, you slipped up. You're going to get defeated in that discussion. So then you build them. And that, that takes time. That doesn't happen just by giving a little bit of information. So firstly, I would say you need to prepare them in that way by propose, posing those questions. Um, secondly, I would say that we need to be on the attack sometime as well. You know, we always are on the defensing about, oh, this is what Islam says. Oh, this is why Islam allows uh, men to inherit more than women. But we need to be sometimes attack their way of life. You know, these, this gender equality and all of these things and this sister's example on MCB. If she went on the offensive and said, wait there a minute, it's your civilization that uh, objectifies women. It's your yeah. civilization that has born from it a multi-billion dollar pornography industry. It's your civilization which has mass rape, mass adultery. Yeah. These are not from our civilization. Our civilization honors women. She went on the offensive and shows the corruption in their way of life. I think that is a better way sometimes. What you're doing is you're doing what when Allah says la, he destroys everything else and he then presents Islam. Uh -huh. Let's destroy their way of life. And then you go, now yours is destroyed. Let me present to you what the creator himself has designed for us, because you might not be able to appreciate it, but this is what gives us, you know, this is what is beneficial for mankind. Yeah, and my last, very last point is yeah. um, a lot of Christians, when they get older and they leave Christianity, they say things like, oh, when I was younger, oh, my parents constantly just said, oh, you're going to hell if you do this. If you lie, you're going to hell. Um, and it was very much like carrot and stick approach. Yeah? And a lot of Christians later say we left it because we never got given intellectual basis for our beliefs. We were just given carrot and stick. Yeah. And then they left it because they were like, that doesn't make sense to us. But, you know, some of our we do that as well. Sometimes we just say to the kids, oh, don't lie. You're going to go to hell or oh, don't lie. Imagine how hot the fire is. But <laughs> You don't give them an intellectual basis <laughs> to understand why. Um, okay, you sometimes have to use that carrot and stick approach, but give them the intellectual basis at the same time. Then they'll be better prepared. The only reason I was laughing there is because it's easy to say to your children, like young, like, which, I, which I do, I've done this past week, that if you be good, you go to gender, you can have everything there, anything you want. <laughs> yeah. Just like, you know what I mean? It's, it's like you said, it's a really good point, man. No, that's a really good point. Uh, brother Imi, any, any final final thoughts, brother? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, 
I th it may come across as if we're talking about individuals doing their own thing, but I think it's important to make it that the, these uh, attacks on Islam is at uh, Ummah level, yeah, not just a localized or yeah. regionalized, yeah, which is very important because what affects us here it affects the Muslims everywhere globally, yeah. And when we say that, um, bring, uh, culturing your kids correctly, yeah, it's, it means that at an Ummah level, yeah, meaning that the thoughts that the people carry, they don't stay in one location, yeah, they move, they travel because thoughts uh, travel. Yeah, and this is the whole p process of revival. Yeah, intellectually elevating the Muslims. So if someone's convinced of a certain idea, they won't hold it in their head. They want to propagate it. Yeah. So wherever they go, where, whoever they see, whoever they, whoever they meet, they want to spread these ideas. And when the non-Muslims, when the enemies of Islam say it's a battle of hearts and minds, yeah, and that's what they mean. Yeah, because obviously it's it's. It's, it's a clash for the Muslims where they want to take away Islam, certain aspects of Islam, and instill their ideas in your mind for you to go out and actually propagate them. Yeah. So in the same way, the Muslims, they should be defending their deen in order to give in the correct ideas and understanding to their children who collectively, on an ummah level, whoever, wherever they go, they spread these uh, ideas, not just in our living rooms or when we're having dinner or whatever so it's, it's more of a collective and global thing and another thing is that the muslims they should be more astute in where they go to uh, for their kids to to learn like rush uh, rush uh, rush said that it's a uh, reaching out to uh, people or muslims who can actually help them and their children in helping that understanding so it's, it's for the muslims to identify who they want to get uh, culture from and then it's at a global level in order to revive and intellectually elevate the Muslims globally, not just in, uh, in one particular area. Yeah, no, no, exactly. I think uh, just just to add in a few few final thoughts, really, is, is just to echo what you said there. Um, you know, when we talk about problems in the Ummah, um, we talk we, we we talk about it in the capacity as the Ummah. So when 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 if I said earlier as 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 Muslims, we need to get closer to Allah, cl closer to the Quran and the Sunnah. We're talking about on a, on a Ummah level, yeah. yeah. Because even Allah, when Allah says, uh, even though this ayat is used in a very individual way, that you know, uh, um, Allah won't change the condition of a people until they, they work to change that uh, situation themselves. Um, but here it's talking about Qom, it's talking about a nation, uh, it's talking about the Ummah. So I think that's that's really important, and uh, and we, we see that the Ummah. Uh, Faces different challenges They try to win hearts and minds And take these ideas that they're spreading to our children Here, to the Muslim lands It was rejected So what did they do? They've taken the Muslim, they've taken the, the, the heartlands Of the, the Arab world, the Muslim world Places like Sham, Bilal al-Sham And places like Iraq You know, taken them uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years backwards From a, from a, a, a destruction and infrastructure point of view Okay, why was it that they couldn't convince those people that their ideas were stronger? It's because they couldn't. It was rejected. And I think for Muslims here that are living in the West, uh, why it's important also is, you know, when we're talking about we better ourselves and our children and so on, we're talking about it that if, if our children adopt this mission, if they become good Muslims, this is, you know, this is adding to the value of the ummah. You understand, and that's how that's how we should be seeing it, and uh, and 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 that's how you know we should be telling our children that you know we're part of an ummah. Um, so yeah, so inshallah, I think. Uh, uh, I'm just going to say the trajectory is right, like you said, the re revival is happening; it's an upward trajectory. But yeah. that doesn't mean it can't go like that again if we're not careful, if we're not prepared. And that's why I think your point is very important. You know, you need to keep on that trajectory and that requires everybody to work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why I mentioned earlier about priorities. You know, uh, is priorities, is our priorities to to give the best schools to our children, as education, or is our priorities to, to make them uh, an asset, something of value to the ummah in regards to the mission of the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And I think I think that, that's what You know Many times I've heard brothers say You know what Even if my, if my child was a road sweeper 
or he was on the dawah and he was on stuff like this, I'd be proud, right? Whilst on the other side, you got flip mode where people would rather their children be doctors and stuff. But if this meant being a bit away from the deen and, and you know, a, a disconnected from the situation of the ummah, then they, they, they're sort of like, okay, to make that compromise. So, inshallah, there were other things that are in my mind, but I'm not going to mention it. I think we should uh, sort of bring the, the podcast uh, to a close. Um, so, inshallah, yes, uh, you know, for our audience out there, who the people who are listening, the people who are uh, watching this, uh, inshallah, provide us feedback. Um, you know, this podcast has become a bit slow. But that's not because of our liking, it's because of the situation. But, you know, we always, if there's any topics and stuff like you want us to cover, discuss that are close to your heart, that you think is going to benefit Muslims, then contact us on our Facebook page, on Instagram, um, and on our YouTube page as well. And uh, if you could follow and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages, that would be uh, of huge benefit to us and inshallah to all those who receive uh, and benefit from, from this message. So, uh, inshallah, I'll end on that note. Jazakallah khair to my lovely, lovely audience. If we were, if we were near each other and, and there wasn't COVID, I'd hug you. But it's not possible right now. So, uh, all I can say is it's been amazing to be in your virtual presence. So, jazakallah for, for that. Imran? <laughs> I said it before. <laughs> no, that's cool. Okay. Asalaamu alaikum, brothers. Inshallah, take care. Walk us off the Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.